Do you need to find the skeleton? How would you tell people that this happens? You personally, how would you tell this happens? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Today we have another update for the community-driven Speculative Evolution Project. Many people have submitted quite a few creatures, and you'll see something of a theme in today's creatures. As a reminder, I've still had some people asking when their creatures will be added, or if I can do theirs next. That's a surefire way to make sure yours are last, or in extreme cases, are ignored entirely. Anyway, I also want to say a special thanks to everyone who's helping in the member and patron Discord server. They are making cladograms, helping with editing each other's works, and in the case of Sean, helping take some of the load off of me for making the art. Well, now that the thank yous are out of the way, time to just dive in. Here are eight more organisms from ancient Almaisha. Whereas Sargrasso dominates the sandier substrate, fields of arch plants dominate the rocky regions, the tangle of retinal fights provides a safe place for many of the smaller organisms of Almaisha. This is the goal of the arch plant. The small organisms who take shelter are used as a dispersal method for the arch plant allowing it to spread farther and more reliably than its pneumos ancestor. Arch plants possess two anchor points, referred to as a foot, that resemble the ancestral pneumos. They consist of three leaves that secrete a glue-like substance to anchor the retinal fight to a solid surface, usually a rock. The center of each foot is connected to a specially adapted nutrient tube that acts as a stem for the arch plant. This stem has multiple leaves that produce a bud on the dorsal side. The bud contains a small gas pocket that will lift the stem up to create the arch position that the retinal fight gets its name from. The buds also contain a gamete shell that they secrete onto the leaves. Arch plants are no longer asexual and have become hermaphrodites. Their buds no longer simply release gametes into the water. They now secrete a specialized gel that coats the leaves. When a free-swimming creature brushes up against the leaves, it will be coated in the gel and transmit the gametes to the next arch plant they take shelter under. The fertilized gametes will naturally detach from the leaf and will be taken by the current until they land on a rock of their own. When an arch plant embryo attaches itself to a solid surface, it will begin to grow into the three-leafed foot that will secrete a glue-like substance to keep it firmly attached. It will take on average 30 local days for the foot to grow to its full size and to begin the creeping phase. The creeping phase is when the archweed begins to grow its stem-like tube. It will grow along the ocean floor, sprouting leaves that will secrete the glue-like substance to keep the current from hampering its growth. Once a secondary hard surface is found, the end of the tube will begin to produce a foot of its own. This process takes on average 240 to 300 local days, depending on how rocky the substrate is and the amount of sunlight the arch plant has access to. Some unfortunate arch plants will grow in a direction that has no hard rocks or corals to attach to. These arch plants never enter into the third and final phase of their life. The final phase is the fully grown arch plant. The leaves that were used to anchor the stem stop producing the glue and detach from the seafloor, and their buds will be and their buds will begin producing the gamete gel. Arch plants can be found in follow arch plants can be found in shallow waters with rocky substrates around Yama and western Kubshai. Some have been found in coral reefs, though they do not seem to thrive in these locations. It is theorized that due to the already crowded nature of the reefs, that the species the arch plant uses for gamete dispersal are more likely to take refuge among the corals than under the leaves of an arch plant. Genetic ancestor? Pneumos. Scientific name? Arcus Grauman Oceanum. Origin ancestry? Retinal phyta. Lifespan? 8 local years. Average height? 100 centimeters. Average length? 150 centimeters. Next up, we have Lacusta pete. A freshwater relative of Sargrasso, Lacusta pete is simply a reduced form of the ancestral Bossio magno. Their simplicity and quick reproduction have allowed Lacusta pete to dominate the rivers, wetlands, and lakes of Yama and western Kubshai. Due to the more substantial nutrients in the soil and consistent temperatures, Lacusta pete develop more stems with a larger leaf in hopes of absorbing more light in the murky water. Creature designed by source blood. Lacusta pete, like Sargrasso, consists of a single rhizoid with two main stalks that extend into a single fan-like leaf. Two smaller stems with smaller leaves emerge between the main stems. They have a much more extensive root system to keep themselves stable in the sandy environment or in fast-moving rivers. Those having taken root in fast-moving environments suffer from the strain on their root system and have a lower life expectancy. Lacusta pete can spread rapidly through vegetative reproduction, where their rhizoid extends horizontally and then sends up new stalks. They also give off haploid spores, which when combined with another haploid spore, will develop into a new colony of Lacusta pete as long as they remain in fresh water. From a spore, it takes only a local week for the first shoots of Lacusta pete to sprout, and from there it will spread. This is due to the fact that the roots need to firmly attach themselves before shoots can be formed. This sometimes results in patches of Lacusta pete in river systems as opposed to the vast fields of them that can be found in lakes. Freshwater systems of Yama and Kubshai are both hosts to large underwater fields of Lacusta pete. Genetic ancestor, Bossio magno. Scientific name, Lacusta pete yamadensis. 
Origin, Retinal Phyta. Lifespan, 10 local years in slow moving water or 5 local years in fast moving water. Average height, 40 centimeters. Next, we come to Neroura. Neroura is closely related to the free swimming Neuropteron, as they both have a gill cord supporting an internal gill system. Where they differ is their lifestyle and habitat. Neroura is still a bottom feeder like its ancestor, Bobird, though it has found its way into freshwater habitats as an amphibious herbivore. Its tail has adapted to bring water with it as it walks onto land and to feed off the soft retinal fights or to escape waterbound predators. Its skin is vulnerable to desiccation, so it must return to the water, though the water it carries in its tail allows for a longer time on land than other amphibious creatures. Neroura is a quadruped with sprawling limbs. Each foot has three fleshy toes, two facing anteriorly and one posteriorly. This is likely to help the pseudotetrapod as it walks through the much more varied terrain. Much like Neuropteron, Neroura has a cartilaginous gill cord used to support the gills. Neroura, however, has an extra expansion on its gills, specialized bladders that can be filled with and store water. The exterior skin around the bladders is elastic and expands along with the bladders. Its tail has several specialized skin flaps, which cover the respiratory system while outside of water. This is primarily to protect the gills from desiccation by retaining the water in the bladders. Neroura has a jawless mouth and masticates retinal fights using a specialized tongue that is very similar to a snail's radula. It is short and covered in cartilaginous teeth to rasp at retinal fights through a vertical slit on the ventral side of its head. Neroura practice sexual reproduction. After storms, they will gather in slow-moving water to breed. Males will compete for females with short wrestling matches, using their inflated tails to balance themselves and attract females. Females will lay their eggs and cover them with a glue-like mucus so they attach to a rock, and the male will then fertilize the eggs. Neroura starts life as an egg that takes on average 28 local days to hatch. This leads to a larval stage that is completely aquatic and resembles the ancestral bobird due to its external gills. After one local year, the gills will recede into the tail and become fully reliant on the gill cord. This form is still waterbound and referred to as a nymph. After another local year, the bladders will fully form and the Neroura is considered a full adult. Neroura can be found in the consistently moist landscapes of Yama, primarily the borders of ponds, swamps, lakes, and slow-moving streams. Neroura is an herbivore that specializes in soft retinal fights. Neroura live solitary lives most of the year, but tolerate the presence of other members of their own species. The chemoreceptors on Neroura are longer and more sensitive than the ancestral bobirds. They also have developed a sensitivity to vibrations at the base, allowing for it to hear more clearly. Neroura's eyes have not changed much due to the murky freshwater it lives in and around. Genetic ancestor? Bobird. Scientific name? Neroura poriforoides. Origin? Pseudotetrapoda. Lifespan, 6 local years. Average height, 5 centimeters. Average length, 19 centimeters. And now the related Neuropteron. With the mass extinction killing off many of the large swimming predators, some members of the Pseudotetrapoda line took the opportunity to become free swimming. This has led to a new line that is more agile and swift swimming than many of the more heavily armored swimmers of the age. Neuropteron lives in small schools above the vast fields of sargrasso plants as small herbivores that have become masters of evasion. Pictured here, a pair of Neuropteron swim over a sargrasso stand. Creature design by source blood. Neuropteron was much thinner than its bobird ancestors. This is mainly to reduce drag while swimming through the water. Its forelegs became more hydrodynamic and flipper-like, convergently evolving with many of the Diomisa descendants. The hind limbs lost much of their muscle mass, and the tips have curled in on themselves, creating a hook-like appendage. These were primarily used for anchoring its body while resting. The most noteworthy feature, though, is the development of a cartilaginous gill cord to support an internal gill system. This protects the gill from parasites, but also allows for more direct circulation of oxygen. Neuropteron practice sexual selection with males competing for females by hooking their hind limbs onto sargrasso stems and attempting to dislodge competitors by swatting them with their pectoral fins. Females will attach themselves to the same sargrasso stem as the victorious male and deposit a string of unfertilized eggs held together by a mucous membrane. The male will then fertilize the eggs and await more females to be attracted to his sargrasso stem. Mating season takes place after the storm season. Neuropteron starts life as an egg and will hatch after 30 local days. They begin as a miniature version of the adults and are referred to as nymphs. They will spend the first two years of their lives among the lower stems of sargrasso fields, filtering food from the substrate until they are too large to swim unhampered by the sargrasso. This marks the beginning of their adult lives. Neuropteron live exclusively in sargrasso fields in the shallow sea between Yama and Kupshai. If the field of sargrasso plants they live on dies out, they will leave in search of another field or be unable to breed. Neuropteron have a sucking jawless mouth and feed exclusively on filtering sandy substrate or on single-celled retinal fights on sargrasso plants. The chemoreceptors on its head have reduced in size compared to the ancestral bobird as a means to reduce drag at the expense of reduced sensitivity. 
This has led to the base of the chemoreceptors becoming more sensitive to vibrations, turning into a primitive ear. Neuropteron are far more reliant on vision than their ancestors, and therefore are purely diurnal. Genetic ancestor? Bulbird. Scientific name? Neuropteron keratomenos. Origin? Pseudotetrapoda. Lifespan? 5 local years. Average height? 2 centimeters. Average length? 17 centimeters. Now we come to the shield neck. The mass extinction brought with it a new radiation of predators that many of the more primitive species have had to adapt to. Descendants of Xenuuli kirbii have always had a tendency to develop thick, chitinous armor to protect themselves from predation, though none have gone to the extreme of the shield neck. Thick armored plates and suction cup-like feet on their hind legs make a difficult meal for even the most determined of predators. Their most alarming feature, though, is when they fully extend their long necks, composed of softer, more flexible segments. This long and flexible neck allows the shield neck to feed on hard-to-reach retinal fights, even so much as to reach out of water and to feed on retinal fights on riverbanks. These adaptations have led to a population explosion in the freshwater-tolerant shield necks, while saltwater populations are limited to the fields of sargrasso plants. Creature design? By source blood. Shield necks have a segmented body that can be divided into four main types of segment, identified by their physical features and function. The first segment type is the head, the majority of which is covered in a large diamond-shaped chitinous shell plate. The plate is one solid color, except in the regions that cover the eyes, where it is translucent so as not to obstruct vision. The ventral side of the head has a circular, soft jaw and a pair of chitin-covered limbs used to masticate plant material. The mouth is surrounded by chemoreceptors within the skin. The second type of segment will be referred to as the exterior neck and consists of four individual segments. These cylindrical segments are very flexible and each possess a pair of eyes and chitin-covered limbs. The third type of segments are referred to as the interior neck and consists of three distinct segments who increase in size until they reach the final segment. They resemble the exterior neck segments, but lack any eyes. In their place are feather-like gill structures housed between their non-functioning chitinous limbs. The interior neck also houses the largest muscles in the shield neck's body, and is capable of fully retracting the exterior neck segments in one earth second. The final segment type is referred to as the shell segments consisting of another three distinct segments. The shell segments are the most diverse and have been given three distinct names, the primary shell, secondary shell, and the tertiary shell. The primary shell is the largest and is covered by two large V-shaped plates that extend over the interior neck segments. The pair of limbs attached to this segment are covered in a much more flexible chitin covering and are the largest. The ends of these limbs are shaped like suction cups and will grip onto smooth surfaces. Internally, the primary shell contains the shield neck's gut. The secondary shell is a smaller version of the primary shell, though internally it contains the reproductive organs. The tertiary shell is reduced even further and consists only of one triangular dorsal plate and is the location of the shield neck's cloaca. Shield necks are hermaphrodites. When the waters they live in warm, they will begin searching for a mate. Once a mate is found, they will deposit a mucus-covered sac of gametes that will be ingested by the mate. The mucus membrane is digested while the gametes travel into the ovipositor. After two local days, the shield neck will produce an egg sac with on average 10 to 20 eggs that the shield neck will carry with it under its tertiary shell. After hatching from their eggs, larval shield necks are free swimming and resemble the ancestral Zetoyuli kirbii. They will feed by filtering substrate for 120 local days, at which point they will bury themselves under the substrate. For an additional 30 days, their bodies will metamorphose into miniature versions of the adult form. After one local year, they will be large enough to breed. Shield necks can be found in the shallow seas between Yama, Kupshai, and Arctica feeding primarily in sargrasso fields. There are, however, three distinct species who live in the freshwater systems of all three of the continents, in lakes, rivers, and streams. The freshwater species have exploded in population due to reduced competition and less prominent predators. Aspidolimus chrysophenios inhabits shallow reefs between Kupshai and Yama. A. yamanensis inhabits the freshwaters of Yama. A. kubayensis inhabits the freshwaters of Kupshai. And A. arcticensis inhabits the freshwater of Arctica. Shield necks primarily feed on retinal fights but are still capable of filtering food out of the substrate. The eyes located on the head segments have much more clear vision compared to its ancestor with limited color visibility. The eyes on the exterior neck segments are much simpler but are sensitive to movement. The chemoreceptors around the shield neck's mouth are sensitive, though only to objects that are close to the mouth. Each shield neck species has a unique coloration based on its environmental pressures. The Yaman, Arctican, and Golden shield necks have adapted to blend into their surroundings by either imitating rocks or retinal fights. The outlier seems to be the Kupshai shield necks, which are much more flamboyant in coloration. This is due to an increased need for visibility. Kupshai shield necks live much more spread out than other species, and the bright colors allow them to more easily identify and find mates. Genetic ancestor? Zuniuli kirbii. Scientific name? Aspidolimo species. Origin? Xenosegmenta. Lifespan? Four local years. 
Average height, 2 centimeters. Average length, 9 centimeter when closed, 16 centimeters when fully extended. Now we come to the snare crown. In the wake of the mass extinction, reef crowns diversified into new niches, one species becoming quite large relative to other reef crown descendants due to its more predatory diet. The snare crown, as they have been called, are sessile predators that feed on small swimming organisms who stray too close to their grasping tentacles. Pictured here, a solitary snare crown has attached to a rock and is waiting for food to swim by. Creature designed by Charid, Dr. Misa, and Saurus Blood. Similar to the ancestral reef crown, the snare crown loses its modal tentacles when it reaches adulthood. They no longer build a tube-like structure out of calcium carbonate, now using it as a short, rounder shell that attaches to the seafloor or corals. Much of the calcium carbonate has been repurposed to the interior tentacles, converting them into crushing teeth that masticate prey items. The snare crown still lacks a through gut and will simply regurgitate indigestible matter. Snare crowns are simple male and female broadcast spawners. These spawnings, like with their ancestors, happen every full moon. Snare crowns begin as a larval form that resembles the ancestral rose crown. It will spend its first approximately 90 local days as part of the planktonic soup before eventually settling onto the seafloor or on a piece of coral. Snare crowns are sessile carnivores who live in the shallow seas around southern Arctica, Yama, and Kupshai. The grasping tentacles of the snare crown are very sensitive to touch and have limited chemoreceptors for identifying prey items. Genetic ancestor, reef crown. Scientific name, Laqueo corona grisio. Origin, Stephanozoa. Lifespan, five local years. Average height, eight centimeters. Next up, we have the spike worm. With the extinction of many of the large oceanic carnivores, some of the carnivores from deeper waters rose up to fill the niches. Sleeping fish were one such species, though their lack of eyes soon became a hindrance as more visual hunters began to outcompete them. They were forced into murky freshwater habitats where the lack of sight was less consequential. These descendants of the sleeping fish would be called spike worms. They get their name from their resemblance to the worms of Earth, but the similarities end there. Spike worms are voracious ambush predators that use specialized chemoreceptor tentacles to find prey. Once detected, the tentacles will latch onto the target while the body coils around its victim, immobilizing the prey while its jaws begin to bore into the victim's body. Pictured here, a spike worm has fled upstream from its normal habitat after losing a battle over territory with a conspecific. Creature design by Saurus Blood. Spike worms have a long cylindrical body that is divided into 15 segments. The first segment is the head and possesses a large circular jaw with four armored teeth used to masticate prey. The head also has four chemoreceptor tentacles that are quite sensitive to touch, positioned radially around the head. The following 13 segments alternate between soft skin covered segments and chitin armored segments. The six armored segments have two dorsal rear facing spikes. These spikes are hollow and protect the gills from parasites in addition to being used as a form of self-defense from other predators. The seven soft skin segments are very flexible and strongly muscled to allow optimal mobility in the often maze-like freshwater ecosystems. This skin is also semi-permeable and allows for respiration on land, so long as it is moist. This is very inefficient though and only allows them to be on land for an hour at most. The final segment is a conical tail that contains a ventral cloaca. This segment is also armored and contains the spine worm's reproductive organs. Like their ancestors, females will release strong scents from their cloaca during mating season, attracting males. When a partner is found, it will release eggs in a large egg sac. After the male fertilizes the eggs, the pair will bury them in soft sediment. Juveniles emerge from eggs as miniature versions of the adults and will feed on small prey items as well as each other until they become 4 meters long and fully adult. This process takes three local years. Spike worms are native to the freshwater habitats of Yama, primarily within lakes and river systems. Spike worms are ambush predators and will hunt a variety of prey, including prey targets that are larger than themselves. When migratory animals swim up rivers, they will congregate to predate on them. Spike worms, like their sleeping fish ancestors, are completely blind and rely on their highly sensitive tentacles to find prey and direct themselves in murky water. Genetic ancestor? Sleeping fish. Scientific name? Ascidasculiki fulveros. Origin? Xenosegmento. Lifespan? 8 local years. Average length? 5 meters. And now, last but certainly not least, we come to Xenoalga. Off the shores of Arctica, where the substrate is more rock than sandy sediment, forests of xenoalga carpet the area in a thick wall of vegetation that in some places reaches the ocean surface. The tall retinophytes are a haven for smaller, more agile herbivores from predators as well as a more stable food source than the temporary and ever-changing fields of sargrasso. Pictured here are a stand of xenoalga on a moonlit night near Arctica. Creature designed by Source Blood and Kipzilla. Xenoalga retains its ancestor's strong stem, but has repurposed the buoyant gases in the top of the leaf. 
The leaf has developed into two separate chambers that will contain the gases and keep the xenoalga tall and buoyant year-round. Leaves have developed around the central stem, similarly to the extinct spiral plant, though in the xenoalga case the leaves are much larger to absorb more light. Xenoalga's rhizoid has a suction cup-like base that keeps it firmly attached to the rocks while its roots grow and dig into the surrounding soil. Xenoalga will once a year develop a third, circular leaf at the top of its stem. This leaf will be filled with gametes and gases. Around the local vernal equinox, the leaf will detach from the stem and begin floating on the surface, releasing gametes as it travels. Should the gametes be fertilized by encountering each other in the water, they will sink to the bottom and attach themselves to a rock. Once the rhizoid is attached to a rock, it will begin growing roots around the rock and into the substrate. This process can take one local week. Once it is established, the stem will begin to grow and the first few leaves will begin to appear. Once it reaches its first 50 centimeters, the top leaves will curl in on themselves and begin producing the buoyant gases. Given good conditions, this will occur after the first local year of its life. Growth begins to accelerate and the xenoalga will reach maximum size after four local years given optimal growing conditions. Xenoalga are native to the relatively colder, shallow waters around Arctica. Genetic ancestor? High stem. Scientific name? Xenoalga procerus. Origin? Retinal phyta. Lifespan? 10 local years. Average height? Up to 30 meters, but commonly much less. Well, that's all for this update. We have a lot more creatures left to go, but this phase has some of my favorite creatures so far, and the fact that we're getting onto land is always exciting. I hope you enjoyed this video, and that you're staying tuned for the next one. Remember, submissions are closed for this phase, but keep checking this space because once I'm done getting all the organisms up on the World Anvil page and on YouTube, the next phase will be open for submissions. If you like this video, please hit like and leave a comment telling me what you liked about it. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell notification and turn on all notifications so you're always informed when I have new content or I will be going live. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. I want to take a little time to thank my channel members and patrons, especially those pledging $20 or more. Bob Knob, Bent Hovind, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, Patrick Dennis, and Res Instance. YouTube is a very volatile platform, what with fraudulent copyright claims, demonetization, and the ever-decreasing share of ad revenue on the platform. It is very hard to rely on YouTube. My members and patrons help keep this channel going, and without them, the channel wouldn't exist. If you'd like to join my Patreon, the link is in the description, and if you'd like to become a channel member, that link is below the video. It's the join button here on YouTube. Either way, you'll get access to early videos, an exclusive Discord server, and if you pledge enough, 3D assets you can use in your own projects.